Welcome to Whiskey Lore. I'm Drew Hanish. And I have just returned from a 6,000 mile trip by car from South Carolina all the way out to Los Angeles, California and back. And the reason for my trip is episode 10, which will be coming up next week. So stay close for that. Make sure you are subscribed to Whiskey Lore to get that episode. And while I was out there, I had the opportunity to go to downtown Los Angeles, take a little look around. I drove around Hollywood and tried to avoid traffic as much as possible, which is not something you can do in Los Angeles, unfortunately. But I did find my way downtown to a place called Infused Spirits. And within Infused Spirits, there is a product that's being released by Seth Benheim, who is uh, the owner there. He has come up with this idea of using barrel staves, sticking them in his whiskey, and then turning it into different types of expressions. Really interesting. I had a cask of Amontillado. We're going to talk about that. Uh, Mizunara oak is something that I'm very interested in. That's a Japanese oak, and he's done some experimentation with that. We're going to talk about those during this episode. And one of my favorite subjects when it comes to whiskey is talking about peat and peated whiskeys. So we're going to get into all of that during this interview. And also, we're going to talk a little bit about where he gets his whiskey from, And it comes from a place that I visited not too long ago on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. And it's a distillery that you may not have thought about going out to visit, but you should because it's a really cool distillery and there's a lot of history there. And so it's definitely worth checking out. So I want to jump right into this interview. Seth Benheim is the owner that Infused Spirits and Broken Barrel Whiskey, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So we had first stepped over before the interview and Seth used a, a, a whiskey thief to pull some whiskey out of a barrel of Isle of Peat, which is one of his expressions. And we'll pick up the discussion from there. So yeah, Broken Barrel is kind of the uh, evolution of what was originally supposed to be infused spirits uh, doing a, a whiskey infusion. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Infused Spirits is pretty much this uh, vodka and uh, bitters brand that I started. And we were taking this approach about single bottle infusions. And when it came to whiskey and trying to tackle the category uh, 2017, we decided that we were going to not do an in bottle infusion. Mm-hmm. And even that you know raise a lot of questions about what kind of brand is this is this is it still infused spirits if it's not a single bottle infusion so we did tank infusions with staves Mm -hmm. and we were breaking barrels and so this kind of very rudimentary concept evolved into a very unique multifaceted approach to whiskey that was so had so much going on so much uh, surrounding it that yeah. it, it was its own brand. Like it, it was like a totally different brand that took its own sort of unapologetic sort of sacrilegious anti-tradition uh, style of making whiskey. Cause we were breaking barrels, putting the wood in the whiskey, not the whiskey in the wood. And it was kind of a, a, a obscure way of finishing, so to speak. And we, you know, when we started doing this, finished whiskeys weren't really popular, at least for American or U.S. whiskeys. I mean, it's really blown up in the last four or five years. Um, and even if you do get one, they are usually putting um, staves in just, or they may pour it into a whole new well, yeah, uh, there's, barrel. There's the maker's mark approach, which is to put additional staves on a ring into a barrel right. and then fill that barrel and build a barrel with twice the amount of wood inside of it. Um, there's even innovations now where you can order barrels that have grooves cut into them mm-hmm. where the actual staves that comprise the barrel okay. are like triple the surface area or quadruple the surface area because they've they've 
created like these ridges and grooves that have more uh, contact of oak to whiskey. But it was that very concept that we said, okay, we're putting so much more in contact because when you think about a stave and the stave being submerged fully into a vat of whiskey, you have the back, the fronts, the sides, all in contact. Some of it with prior contents that are affecting really one and maybe depending on how much it bled into sides of the staves, um, you have this concept of, okay, we're gonna put the wood into the whiskey, see what happens. But for our core brand, the core everyday items that Broken Barrel produces and offers at a pretty you know, uh, good value, I would say, under, you know, under 50 bucks for everything we make. Right. Everything we make has been under 50 bucks to date. Um, or should be. I mean, people may, char- <laughs> people may charge more for it, but that's, yeah. you know, maybe because of availability or if it was just some of the stuff we're going to try is discontinued. So, right. right. Um, but yeah, it, the triple cask uh, concept, three kinds of oak mm-hmm. on these core whiskeys are pretty unique that you're getting all three oaks interacting with the whiskey at the same time, same season. Yeah. So if you were going to say, oh, I want to make a bourbon, And I want to release it and finish it with more bourbon barrels, some French oak, and some, um, let's say, uh, sherry cask, Mm -hmm. which is which we call the composition of those oaks the oak bill. You know, we talk about mash bill all day long, right? But time in the barrel, type of barrel, finish in a different kind of barrel. These are the things that are really, in my mind, driving the. Bulk of the flavor. I mean, yes, a, a single malt whiskey, very different than a bourbon yeah. all day long. Yeah. Uh, or a straight wheat whiskey or a, or a 100% rye whiskey. So so what made you, um, and did you initially choose corn as as the direction to go with, um, with your whiskey in doing we, this? F- we started, if you go, if you're going back and you find an infused spirits labeled mm-hmm. broken barrel bourbon, and you look at the uh, the mash bill, it was, um, I'm trying to remember what it used to be, because I know what it is now. It's now it's 70% corn, 21% uh, rye, 9% malted barley. Before that, it was 75, 21, 4. Okay. So we've increased, we've, oh, we've more than doubled the uh, content of malted barley at mm-hmm. 9%. We've decreased the corn by five, and we've increased the, uh, uh, what's it called? No, we actually left the rye uh, right where it was. Okay. So same rye content. Yeah. And we like that. 21% rye is great rye content. We're very happy with that. Um, we like that the whiskey we use for the core lineup is uh, from Owensboro, Kentucky. We like the Green River, uh, formerly uh, OZ, OZ Tyler. Yeah. Formerly before that, Manly <laughs> Bros. And before that, they had a different name. But yeah. if you follow the history back, and maybe part of the historical element here is... Yeah. To talk a little bit um, as you as you elaborate on this this subject and this brand and any kind of historical ties, this distillery that's producing this whiskey in our in our that we've contracted and again not the distillers uh, on this product we are sourcing, but where where we hang our hat, so to speak, is the process. Yeah, how the barrel breaking, the oak bill, those are the things that make this a unique whiskey in addition to where it's coming from and who's distilling it and the history behind that site, which mm-hmm. is DSPY, uh, DSPKY10, yeah. distillery number 10, like one of the oldest issued licenses in the state of Kentucky, the, the, you know, the motherland of all bourbon whiskey, right? Yeah. So it's kind of uh, special to us that we get to work with partners like that. And we're growing with them. They're, they're relatively new to laying down and putting out... Um, bourbon and rye whiskey considering they only started really laying down product in 2016. So us launching our first whiskey with them in 2017, that was a one, one year and a day old whiskey. Mm. And then in 2018, we were able to blend one and two year in 2019 got a little older. And now we have blends anywhere from two to four year uh, with them. And that can sort of, if you go back and taste what we were making, in 17 versus now it's certainly come a long way and i feel like we've grown with this distillery that's been sort of resuscitated from i think a 25 year closure from when it was medley because medley bros moved to california 
Okay. They're, they're actually, I could drive to their facility where they're bottling a lot easier than I could our own facility where we're working with Green River. So. And I don't think people realize, and I didn't realize, it's on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. It is. But it's the one that's the furthest out. So I West, think a lot yeah. of people probably hold it till last. And it was one of the last ones that I went to. That is a mammoth distillery. Yeah, they do about 90,000 barrels a year. Mm. And they have their own rickhouses on site. Um, they, when I was, I have great pictures of me at the facility because I've been going there kind of annually at least two or three times. I've got three scheduled trips in 2021 already on the books, but the fourth probably at the, in the fourth quarter, uh, I'll be back there. Um, a lot of fun stuff going on this year with, with, uh, with, Owens, with, uh, with it, all the things in Owensboro that are happening. Um, they're adding a new line, bottling line, that we're going to be a part of uh, the production on that line. Um, we are doing new packaging. We are uh, increasing the age of all of our whiskeys. Yeah. Um, so, so you're in LA, but yeah. your production's actually going to come out in the heart of bourbon country. And we even got it. We finally can, you know, I, I said we're not a distillery. We actually technically are now are a distillery. We just <laughs> got a distilling license oh, nice. uh, at the end of Q, Q1 uh, 2021. So we will be doing some R&D blending and distilling here with the thought being like, you know, if we put out a barrel or two a month as sort of special projects for blends and then also distill and lay down some more specialized whiskeys here, that will be something we're going to work on. Yeah. But the main production, the, the tens of thousands of bottles will be made at the big guys. I mean, when I say big, I mean, they're big relative to us, but right microscopic relative to like Jim Beam and, and uh, you know, uh, Brown Foreman, you know, even Angels Envy and some of these other brands, they put out a lot more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how do you go about choosing the staves that you're going to use? Um, because you're really almost blending before blending. Um, yes, it, 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 I would equate it to like cooking. Yeah. So we have a recipe. We have a selection of oak suppliers or barrel suppliers. Mm -hmm. And then we have types of barrels that we're looking for. And the original recipe was developed uh, very much how if I said, hey, go about doing a triple cask finish, but you can't empty from cask to cask to cask. So okay. you can't take a whiskey or a vat of whiskey and then fill bourbon barrels and then dump them in that you're not allowed to do that yeah that that option's out so what do you do <laughs> so the next the next idea was okay we'll age one vat with french oak next to it in the same room same temperature same environmental uh you know height heat everything uh that you think could affect the interaction between wood and whiskey mm -hmm. uh keep that all exactly the same so then you have another vat next to it with uh, French oak and then a third vat with, um, uh, what's it called, uh, sherry cask. Okay. And then you let all three age for the same exact amount of time, same exact whiskey in each vat and same amount of oak. And then you, ex you pull samples and then you start the blend. Yeah. So you blend. So we did 50-50. We did, you know, a third, a third, a third. We, did, we tried a bunch of, and the winning recipe ended up being 40-40-20. Mm. So 40% of the bourbon, 40% of the French oak, and 20% sherry cask. It was that sort of hint of sweetness, that finish, uh, which you'll get to taste in, in a moment here. Yeah. Um, that was kind of how we came up with it. And then we said, look, will this have the same effect if we do it all at once? And it actually came out even better mm. doing it all at once and doing it you know, on a, on a larger scale. We've been very fortunate, very lucky that the things we've tried on on – a single bottle scale or even like a five gallon Gatorade jug scale. Yeah. We've been able to not only replicate it, but improve it at mass. And one of the nice parts about the process has been the, a bit, you know, if you fill barrels and barrels are full, really what more are you going to do other than dump more whiskey into more barrels and then try and blend in a larger batch? Suddenly you may have too much product. Yeah. We don't want to go too heavy on the supply side, especially not knowing if all of it's going to sell and how quickly. The for a small company managing its costs, of course, uh, we have the ability to taste it along the way mm -hmm. very easily, 
and then say, you know what? Uh, let's do a, a little bit more oak because we want to get this thing out by the you know next month by the fifteenth. Let's do two more staves of this, two more staves of that, one more stave of this. Ah. We can cherry pick it okay. down to the individual staves. Yeah. So very much like cooking, if you take recipe calls for a teaspoon of salt and you put it in, and you taste it and you go, oh, that still needs salt. Yeah. You can do that. You can add that extra salt. You're the chef. Yeah. So in this instance, we are the the mad scientist, so to speak, uh, if you want to, or the alchemist or whatever you want to call us, yeah. the, the heretics <laughs> uh, <laughs> behind the scene that we can take a few more staves because we can get as many barrels as we need. Yeah. These are not, you know, ridiculously hard to find barrels. Um, you know, there's ample sherry cask available. You know, the scotch industry is definitely been a huge um, uplifter of the the sherry cask availability and then you know nowadays you can get it you can get cognac casks armagnac casks uh, yeah you can get all kinds of stuff and people are using them a lot of different that's the fun uh, part and that's what's really helping to make whiskey much more interesting um, when everybody's making you know a, a corn whiskey or they're using you know you can vary the mash bills around just so much and then, yeah. you know, it's, it's where do we take it from there? And the finishing is something that's been fun to watch in Scotch whiskey and see how it's really added a lot of character, even within a particular line. Like um, I went to Lefroy, mm -hmm. and when you do their warehouse tour, you get to pull straight from a cask. And they had a cask of Amontillado, which is my... Yeah. Uh, it, it, the name I know you also like Edgar Allan Poe. That that I've was got the, a Poe book somewhere in this office. That was the thing. One. Yeah, that was the thing that drew me to it. Now imagine adding that in a peated whiskey. You know, you're basically putting a peated Lefroy into this sherry or this uh, yeah, port the, finish yeah. uh, barrel, and what an interesting combination. And that takes your in that case, a Lefroy experience and, you know, up the I'll have Annie. to try a Lefroy and an Amontillado barrel. Yeah. Because we, we, uh, this whiskey, the first, we can start with this one. Okay. Um, so in 2019 was the first year that a product left uh, our facility with the banner broken barrel whiskey, mm -hmm. not infused spirits. And we launched kind of, ambitiously and maybe mistakenly three different uh what i call the single oak series normally <laughs> in hindsight a whiskey company may be better off uh or a brand be better off putting out its core line yeah under its name versus launching under a new name with three never before seen <laughs> products right that were our most expensive products and our most kind of uh advanced products so Hindsight certainly may be better to have launched with the core stuff uh, under the new name, right? Yeah. Uh, but we l did not do that. <laughs> we, we went big and bold right out of the gate. Uh, <laughs> thank God we sold it all. Didn't, you're not sitting on it. But nice. the three were uh, called the Single Oak Series, and each one was an exploration of the effect of one kind of oak Mm -hmm. on a blend of American whiskeys. So all American uh, distilled whiskeys from both Kentucky and Indiana. So we do use a little MGP in this lineup. Okay. But that we don't use MGP or Indiana in any of our other core whiskeys. They're all yeah. uh, from Owensboro. So okay. the first one is the Isle of Peat. This is a 55% wheat and malt uh, blend. Interesting. So it's got 0% corn. It's a 95% uh, wheat, 5% malted barley with yeah. a 100% malted barley. So what made you think of going with weeded when doing a, um, when, when putting it into a, well, uh, actually the opposite, putting uh, a peated stave into. So we went with a uh, uh, business partner of mine is in the Scotch whiskey trade and mm. they are an independent bottler of several different distilleries. We were able to get our hands on some 15 year old Lefroy barrels. Mm. So we dumped the Lefroy barrels into the blend and we loved the way it came out. We tried bourbons and we tried corn whiskeys. We tried wheat whiskeys. We tried rye whiskeys and none of them took to the, the peat well. Yeah. It was malted barley. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense now why 
There are so many peated scotches and very few peated bourbons. Peated bourbons don't taste very good. Yeah. I've tried several different ways of doing this. And I've even read articles from people over at like Westland and High West who have tried to merge peat and bourbon. And it's not very good. Like people, (laughs) something about corn and the sweetness and sort of mouth profile and flavor profile. It's very juxtaposing to the sort of iodine, salty, briny, and yet smoky and earthy nature of peat. Yeah. And so they're very disagreeable uh, uh, flavors that don't like each other. Um, meanwhile, wheat I found to be a little bit creamier and softer mm-hmm. than corn um, and also a lot smoother. And a lot of people love, you know, Weller or Maker's Mark as weeded bourbons yeah. for being really smooth versus rye being a little more spicy. Um, but this wheat really mellowed out the... Uh, the maltiness for lack of a better term of the single malt and both are very young, but they were really advanced in their profile and sort of age estimated age. Yeah. When I did the process of adding the Lafroy barrels, but what you're tasting today is something that I then rebarreled about two barrels worth of it. Yeah. In Ardbeg barrels. <laughs> oh, nice. Now, if I can get my hands on some log of wool and I'll call it the Holy Trinity of tea. <laughs> um, Absolutely. <laughs> so maybe we'll pull them out of the barrels and then let them uh, broken barrel it with a little more oak bill nice. of some log of oil. And yeah. then we've got the uh, three different casts from the three you know largest peat producers, I would say. Yeah. The big three. So get uh, get all three in there. But yeah, this is just a nice light. The entry proof on the barrel here was uh, 110 proof. Mm-hmm. So not too strong. Um, I don't believe it, it has picked up any proof since I put it in there. And this has only been in the Ardbeg barrel for about three or four months now. Okay. How long do you usually tend to? Uh, this is this is this is just uncharted. totally totally ex- this is experimentation. Just on taste. Yeah, this is just on taste, and we're not getting to taste the outside of the barrel. That's what's interesting about breaking up the staves is that you're not only tasting what uh, history it had inside, yeah. but you're tasting what history it had outside. <laughs> I mean, you know, like if you if you think about like ordering sushi, and they say like, okay, it's got salmon inside and albacore on the outside. Yeah, this is kind of like a sushi roll in that it was the inside and outsides of a Lafroy barrel. Now it's the inside of an Ardbeg barrel. Yeah. And unless I break up these Ardbegs and put them back into it, you're only going to uh, experience the inside of the Ardbeg. And if I can get my hands on some Lagavulin, then maybe the outsides of that. So inside, outside, inside, you know, we may have to specify on our, on our, uh, label when we do release this when we release this who knows yeah but this is basically the isle of pete and then okay. there were two more in the lineup um we did one called mizunara which was a corn whiskey blend mm-hmm. four and five year old product uh finished in mizuna finished with sorry with mizunara barrel staves and then we did uh the cask of amontillado named yeah. directly after the name of the edgar Allan poe uh, Amontillado being a Spanish uh, sherry. Mm-hmm. So we we had all three of these bottles have great artwork. And that one's actually a 12-year-old and 5-year-old uh, whiskey blend. Okay. And I'll actually open that up for you to try. Oh, next. nice. Yeah, that was... Um, I, I did a tour at Lafroy and got a chance to do the, uh, the tasting. And I don't know that they ever bottled it. I think it was just for the tour. It was like, here is an experiment that our master distiller liked enough to uh, open up to us to be able to taste. So, um, and what would be fun is to be able to taste what uh, Amontillado tastes like because I've never tasted it uh, before. So, I have uh, Oloroso sherry here, but I don't have Amontillado. Okay. <laughs> I was, that was the other question I was going to have. When you're using sherry barrels, um, are you using uh, PX cask or are you using... Uh, when, when we're uh, using... Uh, we are not for the broken barrel everyday products. That's our small batch 95 bourbon. Yeah. Our 105 um, rye and our, our cast strength. We are not using uh, Spanish sherry barrels. We are using American sherry barrels. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and so... Being in California, we have access to some pretty uh, fresh uh, sherry barrels that aren't yeah. crossing the ocean. And, you know, we, we've obviously what you're about to taste is, you know, some of the oldest, you know, this is 20 something year old Amontillado sherry. It's corn whiskey. It's got a really fascinating 
blend to it. But for the everyday products, we like the freshness of these American sherries, you know, American produced products. We, we lean towards American product mm -hmm. through and through. We try to work with what we can um, for the everyday stuff and for the volume stuff. Um, we like to keep it very accessible. You know, we don't want to have a certain, uh, let's say like a, like a winemaker or a producer, like we don't want to marry ourselves to a wine or a, or a sherry yeah. that may not have availability during our sort of ebb and flow of what we need. <laughs> we don't want to marry ourselves to like, let's say we were using a Scotch barrel, we were using Laphroaig and we, we couldn't get our hands on a, a certain type of Laphroaig barrel. Yeah. You know, we'd probably be more likely on an everyday product to say Scotch barrel or be a little more, nondescript only to prevent running out of that if we if we found ourselves unable to access it yeah that's all that's so this crazy. has a like dark fruit on it yeah <laughs> it's very it, different than the last it, one it definitely does um i i don't know if i'm getting residual smoke off of that i mean the smoke is very light on the yeah. isle of pete but yeah it's, uh, it's a touch it's yeah. just a touch um but this one it's like there's a almost like a uh campfire smokiness to it that i've that I'm getting along with everything else. You can tell this is a bourbon versus that because this one corn, has that. Corn, yeah. Uh, technically, none of it's bourbon. Yeah. Technically, none of it's bourbon. Okay. It's, been, um, it's got corn that, whiskey. Yeah, because the, the kind of the body of it, um, and then it's got that uh, bit of, of caramel that you. Yeah, it's a little. It. This one's chewier, and yeah. I would say even meatier. It yeah. has almost like a, like a barbecue effect to it. But there's. Uh, I haven't had this in a minute. This is great. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we opened this bottle because I'm going to take this one home. <laughs> mm. That's uh, the advantage of, of being in charge, right? Yeah. Nice. Well, this is... Uh, well, yeah, maybe you could take that one. I'll grab another one. Um, <laughs> the 55% uh, 110 proof on this as well. So both of these are 110. Okay. And do you... Uh, I noticed... Um, the bottle you sent me was a, a 116 proof and I see a 95 proof here. Do you try, is there a range you try to stay in or you just kind of feel it from, um, uh, from each whisk, from each whiskey style? Once we, once we land on a proof we like yeah, and it becomes part of the core lineup, I mean, it, they, these aren't single barrels, so they aren't going to stay the same proof. Um, so our small batch, we wanted to find a proof that was, uh, approachable mm -hmm. something that would give you know the guys that want a little more for their buck but also not scare away you know the somebody that's going to say oh my god it's 100 or 110 or you know we're not going to do an entry level bourbon and again a high this proof. is a, yeah. this, this generally sells between 30 and 35 dollars yeah for a small batch bourbon so okay. it's not meant to be something i think it's good proof yeah. uh 95 for the price and then for rye whiskey little higher 105 yeah, yeah um we wanted this to really be uh, a penetrating rye for cocktails espe mm -hmm. especially so if you're gonna make a drink you're gonna still taste that rye whiskey no matter how much you know uh how many different ingredients you're gonna throw at it so let's say you're making i don't know um a boulevardier or a manhattan or something and you're grabbing um what is that one i use the vermouth the uh Antica, I love the Antica vermouth, uh, mm -hmm. that red top, the big, uh, the big bottle. So yeah. Antica vermouth, you know, you're going to throw some of that in there. That's a heavy, strong, um, uh, Amaro or, you know, vermouth. It's a, it's a very powerful flavor and this, you still taste the rye when you make a drink with it. So we love that. Now the California Oak, which is kind of our becoming more of our flagship product, especially here in California. Um, and where it's sold, this product, uh, very non-scientific. I was born in 1988, so we picked uh, 88 okay. proof. Nice. Yeah, this is kind of like my my uh, my whiskey, so to speak. Okay. In that it was made, you know, the year I was born, the pl the city I live in, or the state I live in, you know, California. My my parents met here. I was born in San Francisco, grew up in LA. Uh, it's just California is something special, and we make great wine. So why not use some Cabernet? Uh, from the Central Coast, not from Napa. Uh, so we, we mixed it up a little bit there. Mm -hmm. And we sent those barrels off to Kentucky and, and did the bourbon, the broken barrel 
uh, oak bill to the bourbon yeah. up there. So who gets to break the barrels? Well, I break anything that, that I can here, but no, they, <laughs> they are breaking. We bought them sledgehammers and axes, and if I'm not there to do it myself, uh, the team in Owensboro uh, has, they, they'll not only break them, they'll videotape it, and that is how we get a lot of the content now for social media websites and stuff. I was going to say, when my computer starts having problems uh, and, and I feel like punching my keyboard, it'd be really nice to just go back into the back room with a sledgehammer and take it out on a <laughs> bourbon barrel. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it, we, we try to get all the employees that work here to, to at least put some fruit in a bottle on the vodka and at least... Uh, break a barrel or two so nice so what did you think of that amontillado i liked it it um i don't know if the floral is coming from from the rye because it's kind of a high rye um in terms it's of the rye, yeah. yeah um but there was a floral in there and a little, little bit of um like a dark dark fruit fruitiness to it very nice and then the last one is that mizunara which you, you can uh excellent which, you know, I've been um, experimenting a little bit with um, Japanese whiskey and uh, trying to learn a bit about uh, Mizunara oak. And uh, as I understand, it can be kind of an expensive oh, yeah. <laughs> oak to work with. Um, so you got to be serious about wanting to uh, create something out of it. Um, it's expensive. You know, the, the one... Uh, beautiful thing about the way we make whiskey or, or, or process it with the oak bill is that we're not worried about leakage because we're just dumping the oak right in. So yeah, I know that there are some horror stories about filling and, and trying to keep the, uh, the integrity of a barrel made with Mizunara. You know, there's tremendous horror stories of loss and leakage mm. and, and spillage and all that. And thank God we're not dealing with that. So. <laughs> yeah, you, I, I don't actually, envy. I don't envy that. You have the solution for that, actually, because well, uh, yeah, we were able to pull a lot of nice sort of apple um, sesame flavors out of this one, and it's got a much. This is going to be the lightest whiskey, not just in proof, but in just general flavor. This is a. You can just tell by the color. This is a mm. much much lighter whiskey. This is way more akin to like an Irish or. Um, uh, younger scotch, like a Highland whiskey. Yeah. But I still get like a little toffee out of that. It's funny how my, uh, my taster is less sensitive right now. And there are certain flavors that just pop out to me over other ones. Um, the fruity flavors kind of tend to, uh, stick out. There's a little like light caramel on that too. And it's, um, it's interesting because this is uh, also four and five. Uh, this is the four and five year corn whiskey. Yeah. So what's really nice about the single oak series is for the for the last two we've tried, you get a much bigger impact from the oak. Mm -hmm. um, we we used whiskeys in the blend for Isle of Pete that were both aged in new charred oak barrels. Yeah. The wheat whiskey and the single malt were went into new charred oak. That didn't get in the way because that's obviously a much more powerful barrel than a used barrel. Mm -hmm. And it didn't get in the way of imparting some great flavor from a Lefroy barrel. Lefroy's real strong. Yeah. So it, it can it can balance nicely with a strong um, first fill barrel. The Amontillado and the Mizunara are blends of two different whiskeys each. And both whiskeys in both blends are used barrels. None of these whiskeys saw new charred oak at any point in time. Right. Which is, which is why they can't be bourbons. And that's even why if, they can't be bourbons. they had a They're, bourbon mash bill. They even bill, say yeah. on the label corn whiskeys. Yeah. And, you know, if, if, if you have a bourbon mash bill, but it goes into a used barrel, that's, yeah. a, that's a corn whiskey or an American whiskey. But you can't call it bourbon. Okay. And so what's cool about these is used barrel aged whiskey still has a lot of flavor to accept. Yeah. It can take on a Montiato. I mean, look at the color difference between the two yeah. different oaks. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you like the, the 12 year old in the Amontillado blend was no darker than what's in your hand, the Mizunara. So really that Sherry clearly had a, a color impact. And then the Mizunara really did not do a, a tremendous uh, amount to the color. 
Well, I appreciate Seth and his time that he took today telling us a little bit about Broken Barrel Whiskey. There is more to this interview, and if you're a Whiskey Lore Society member, you can hear it by heading to patreon.com slash whiskey lore. And by the way, I did see the three whiskeys we talked about today while in Kentucky, so check your local retailer. You can learn more about Broken Barrel Whiskey by finding them on instagram.com slash broken barrel whiskey. Whiskey Lore is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC. Find show notes and more at whiskey-lore.com slash episodes. And until next time, cheers and slanjava.